Welcome, Robin. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me, Zibby. Very excited to be here. Oh, and as I was just telling you, this is so fitting because of construction. I am sitting in my daughter's room with her stuffed animals all around me. So it's like, <laughs> Moms Don't Have Time to Podcast today, but that's no, okay. It's a beautiful <laughs> wallpaper, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, so I have to tell you, your book, uh, The Idea of You, uh, a friend of mine named Joyce Chang, who is awesome and used to be the editor of People Magazine and is a good friend of a good friend and who I've known for a while, was like, you have to read this book and have this author on your podcast. Mm -hmm. And whenever people say that, like who I'm good friends with, actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't admit this, but when a good friend of mine is like, you have to have this book on, I, I, I take special care to read that book. And, and anyway, as soon as I started reading this, I was like, I get it. I get it. <laughs> thank, thank Joyce for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will thank Joyce for you. Um, so Robin, would you mind just tell, tell listeners about the idea of you and how you came up with this plot. And then I want to talk about your whole acting career and how all of this is sort of intersected with, with this book. Um, so The Idea of You is a story of Selene Marchand, who is a 39-year-old uh, sophisticated divorcee here in Los Angeles, I'm in LA. Um, she, is a, she owns an art gallery with a, a partner, and she's got a 12-year-old daughter who's obsessed with this British boy band. And she kind of gets enlisted to take her daughter and a few friends to a meet and greet and concert for the band. And at the meet and greet, one of the guys in the band kind of falls for Selene, and he's half her age. And they embark on a, uh, <laughs> a bit of a tryst and very quickly becomes this very involved, genuine love story. And um, the, their relationship kind of, uh, as it flowers, it affects her life, every aspect of her life in unexpected ways. And so that's the story. And I saw um, I saw in your acknowledgments you credited your husband. I, I <laughs> Tell did. me about that. <laughs> well, um, it was uh, I guess about six years, seven. Oh my gosh, I'm bad with math. Seven. My gosh, it's seven years ago. It's 2014. Seven years ago now. About this, it was March of of 2014, and my my kids were still quite small, and my husband was away on business, and I was home late one night. Um, surfing YouTube. And I was just looking up random music acts and I came across this band with this guy in it with, with a beautiful, beautiful face, but obviously very young, um, but just ridiculously beautiful. And I kind of went down a rabbit hole for an hour, like <laughs> looking into everything about him and discovered that he occasionally dated older women. And I kind of just kind of planted the seed. And when my husband came back from the, uh, from New York, we were, uh, at an event two nights after that, I guess. And I told him, I was like, you know, I found this, the perfect guy. I'm thinking about leaving you and the two kids and just kind of running off and finding him. But, you know, he's half my age and he's in a band. How do you feel about that? <laughs> and, and he laughed and he was like, you are crazy. But that would make a great book. And like the second he said it, it just, I could see it from beginning to end. It all just fell into place for me. I don't think I've I've never, I mean, I've written all my life, mostly for myself and for pleasure. I've never had a story just like play out in my head so clearly, so quickly, so specifically. Like I just saw it and I was like, that's it. I could write this book and I could do it really well. And I would really enjoy the process. And I say I could do it really well is because I, I you know, I just turned 40 and I was dealing with a lot of the baggage that comes along. He should be able to enjoy turning 40. Now that I'm like so far past that, 40 is like, oh, that was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like it was looming big for a very long time. And I, I'm an actress here in, in, in Hollywood and I've been an actress for a quarter of a century now. Oh my God, that sounds like a long time. But I, I could see like how the offers and the roles that I was, I was being submitted for had changed drastically from my 20s and even my 30s. Like once you hit 40, like things just dry up. There are just fewer opportunities um, for really great roles that are outside of like just the mom or just like the neighbor or whatever, the neighbor's wife or the, the detective, whatever it is. It's just, it, there were fewer and fewer opportunities <laughs> and they were not as juicy and um, multi-layered as I would have liked 
And I just kind of feel like, God, Hollywood really throws us away at a certain age. Like they save the really good roles for the Nicole Kidmans and the Viola Davises and Angela Bassett's or Kate Blanchett's or whatever, but like just like great roles even on TV. And that's changed in the last seven years. I will say there've been some incredible female roles, older women roles on TV. Um, but seven years ago, it was like, there was just, there was so, there were so few. There were so few, like Netflix wasn't a th making their own content. Amazon wasn't making its own content. Hulu did not exist. Like, and um, I was kind of like angry. <laughs> I'm not angry at the world, but at the business and like, and just wanted to show that women still have a lot to give. And at 40, you're kind of, you can just come into your own. And I think you're, you're it's when you're kind of hitting your, your peak of your power and uh, women in business or whatever that is, that the world kind of tells you that you're, you're no longer viable. You're no longer, um, I don't want to say a bad word, but you're not, you're no longer desirable. And it's like, and, and you become invisible. And I wanted to show what that was and what that felt like. And I wanted to do it by this woman kind of, you know, coming out of a divorce, she's three years out of divorce and she finds this guy who kind of reawakens her and her sexuality and like who she is and her identity. And I wanted to explore all of that. And I just thought I could do it and have fun with it. And I'd, um, right out of, college i'd started a, a company with a girlfriend of mine in new york and we were managing singing groups and one of our groups is an all girls group um and we were produced by one of the new kids on the block and they were kind of just at, kind of just past the height of their fame i guess at the height of their fame and then, and then coming down and so i got to know them and see what their lives were like when they were still quite famous and and they're and they're famous now like they took up like i don't know how many years they took off eight twelve whatever it was um but there was you know back in the the, the 90s like that they were just still like massive successful and huge fandom and to see what it was like to be caught up with them at that point in time was really eye-opening and i thought oh i know what this is i could write a boy band i just need to research and see what boy bands lives are like today and what shows are doing and what you know, what are the big talk shows and publicity and what tours look like, but I know what that energy is. I know what the energy is like being a girl experiencing it. Cause I used to be obsessed with Duran Duran. Um, and I know what it's like to be in a, in a stadium full of like screaming girls and like feeling like this is the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me. And I also know what it's like to look at it as a 40 year old woman and, and like, and kind of, and kind of assess like what, you know, you, you don't, you don't get caught up in the magic in that way, but you can still be attracted to them in that way. And so that I figured, let's go and explore it. And that's what I did. And did you have as much fun as you thought you would? Um, absolutely. I had a lot of fun, but it was also way more of an emotional toll than I ever expected. Like I felt like I lived this relationship and I went on this journey with this woman and I was like living it in real time. And when it was, I don't, I, have you, are we doing this assuming that your readers have read it and can I talk about the ending or can I not talk about the ending of the book? It's up to you. I mean, <clears throat> some people are just finding out about the book, okay. I would so imagine, I'm not, I'm not, and some people have read it and want to know more. So it's up to you. So I'm not going to give away too much about the end, but about three months out when I knew it was ending and I knew my time with them was coming to an end, I was really depressed. Like I would cry every day I'd cry writing. I'd have to stop, close my laptop and just like curl up in a ball and just like cry for an hour and then start again or 20 minutes or whatever it was. It was really emotional for me. I'd gotten so um, close to them and attached to them. And I felt so connected with them. And I felt for, you know, for the year and a half, whatever year and three months that I was writing this, they were living in my head. And like, there were like three of us in my brain and knowing that I was gonna have to push two of them out and be like, that's it, we're done. I'm done with the two of you. You have to go now. It was really, really hard. Um, way more than I'd ever experienced writing anything book prior and way more than I, I'd i expected. And, and that, that I even thought I could handle at times. Like I really felt like I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy. These people are like living in my head and it and maybe this is like, some form of um, schizophrenia or something. Like, I wasn't sure what it was, like a hallucination, like wh why I heard their voices so clearly, it was so specific. But at the same time, I didn't want to lose them because I knew that 
that was part of the magic. Like I felt like I could write for them because they were so clear to me. And so it's, it's kind of, <laughs> as a writer, you're kind of, you're balanced. Like, am I, am I insane? Am I going crazy? Am I hallucinating? Or is this like what they talk about is like finding, um, oh my goodness, I'm going to forget her name now. Elizabeth, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Gilbert. Gilbert, thank you. She does this incredible TED talk about finding your, your, your what genius is and like, in, and how genius we talk about people as, as today as being geniuses, like it's someone that you are, but in the past it was like something that you owned or something that you held on to. And she talks about like finding your genie and how, <laughs> how it could just be in the wind and you just grab it and you hold on to it and you're writing and you're using it and then you let it go and, it, and it's gone and you can't get it back. And that kind of um, paralysis when you feel like, oh my gosh, what if I can never get it back? But I really felt like I had this genie at that point and I didn't want to lose it no matter what it was. It's like, I'm not going to go to therapy for this just yet. <laughs> like, I don't want to lose these voices. And so and it so was a lot more emotional than I expected. So then, so then what happened when you got to the last page? Um, I, I was very relieved and very happy and very satisfied with what I'd written. But I cried, I would say, every day for about 18 months. Oh, my gosh. For a long time. Robin. <laughs> and it was really, yeah, it was really, really rough. And it took a long time for me to separate from them and be like, okay, I can go on. I can do other things. I don't have to be obsessed with them now. They're not living in my head. They're not a part of me. They all have their own lives outside of me <laughs> and I can do other things. But it was really, um, it was very difficult to separate. And then of course the book came, comes out and everyone's like, are you doing a sequel? When are you doing a sequel? And I was like, I can't let those people back into my head just yet. I have to heal. I have to like, I will go crazy. I will like, they will have to like commit me. <laughs> like I can't, like I really felt like I was losing my mind and I felt very haunted by them, by him especially, by the Hayes character. I felt very haunted by him for a long time. And so it, it's, um, it's been very tricky separating hmm. <laughs> and, and trying to create art. Uh, it's like, it's like, se it, it is, it's like you're having, separation anxiety from the characters have you had anxiety in other areas like does this was does this not make sense and sort of like overall anxiety or is this completely um, left field I, i'm not you know i'm not normally an anxious person definitely since covid it's, it's kicked in in the beginning months of covid my, my anxiety was like crazy but i ended up having high blood pressure like right right of diagnosed right before the release of the book and I could feel it like I could feel my, like my heart racing and um and so I'm on medication for that now <laughs> um but I I definitely I mean both of my parents had it. it was in my family I was going to get it eventually but I definitely time it with the release of this book like the stress and the anxiety that I felt with the releasing of this novel was definitely what kicked it into to gear for me I'm 100% certain that's what did it um I'm I mean, part of, I'm not, not to say I'm not surprised because this is like a unique attachment to characters, not unique, but that the extent of your attachment to them, right, right, right. is, is yeah. on one end of a spectrum that I feel like a lot of people are on, but your characters in reading them feel so real. So it's almost like not surprising to me because you get so invested in their it's like the alternate life, right? It's like going to all these amazing places you wish you could go to and like this beautiful villa in the south of France and how amazing would that be and all this. Stuff. I mean, it's it's almost like it's like the life you don't live, right? So it's almost like you're not really just saying goodbye to the characters, you're saying goodbye to yeah, to the fantasy, to the to the life you didn't live. Right. Which and most hard. of those places I've been to, so it's like... I, well, right, yeah. <laughs> but, did, but not in that way. <laughs> well, you're not living them right this not, second, I guess. No. Well, <laughs> no, no, and I have to tell you, and maybe I shouldn't even, but um, I actually got divorced and then I remarried someone younger than me who's not as young, but um, he's only six years younger. But it feels like a lot younger when you have kids and all that. <laughs> yes, um, sure. And we did sort of like, I did go from being married for over a decade to wow. all of a sudden, you know, 
having this very, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like whisked off your feet again and like whisked off my feet again um, with right. this very confident, like younger man who I was like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> with children. So similar to um, Selene, like not in the same thing, but like, right. I feel like I had a piece of that in my oh, own life. So I was like reading this, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I think it's a really unique, incredible experience, extraordinary experience to fall in love. And I think it only happens a few times in one's life. Um, for me, it definitely happened twice, at least, <laughs> including my husband, someone before my husband and then my husband. Um, and then I kind of, there was a sadness thinking, oh, I'll never have this again, like this magic. Cause it's not like you fall in love with your husband all over again every single day. Like you love him, but it's not that kind of, you know, <laughs> swept off your feet, like everything is a surprise and everything is new and wonder, full of wonder. Um, and someone told me, oh, that'll change. You'll have it again when you have babies. And I was like, it's not going to be the same. But it, but it definitely is a high when you have a baby that, that first year or so and just discovering every little thing about them. And so when I, we were talking about kids before this, when I had my daughter, who's now 12, and I knew she was going to be our last, I held on to every moment of it. And I remember thinking, this is the last time I'll ever fall in love this way. This is the last time. I'll ever... And that's it. Like, that's my whole life. And, and that was a very sad thing. Like, um, assuming my husband and I stay together, this is it. Like, I'll never have that feeling. But writing this book, I definitely fell in love with this character and the way that it felt when I first met my husband and the way that it felt when I first met my boyfriend, who was like my, my first love, real love. Um, and I never imagined that could happen again and through fiction. And it was really surprising. And so I think letting go of that too was kind of like, it was really like a breakup. Like I'm losing this guy. I'm, I'm, that's it. Like our relationship is over and it's been this incredible whirlwind. I know I'm gonna cry. <laughs> but, um, it was really hard to say goodbye and, and I don't know that'll happen again. It's like that kind of magic. And I feel like I put so much into him, the idea of like putting so much into another male character in that kind of situation, like I just can't even visualize it. And I, and I, and I don't know that I wanna write another story like this. Like I feel like I wrote one really good love story, maybe love, like, I don't know that I can, I wanna explore other things before I come back to the doing another love story. You don't have to do another love story. I'm not going to force you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. This one is great. Um, you know, the idea that we always have to be constantly creating more and more, right? right. I mean, to have one amazing love story and to be able to have characters so vivid and take the reader on this complete ride emotionally and physically. I mean, like I was reading the other night, I was reading some of this and I'm in the middle of like, you know, one of the scenes when like they're about, well, I don't want to give anything, but it like a very physically intense scene. And I'm like halfway through it and my eyes are wide, like staring. And next thing you know, my, my son is like, come upstairs. I need you right now. And I'm like, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I felt like, Right. I was like, let me just get to the end of this. Like I'm right in the middle. Like I felt like right. I was right in the middle of it, which of course was ridiculous. Really. I was just in my crazy house with like kids everywhere. And you know, anyway, it, Feel it. I it's have, uh... the ability of fiction to transport, obviously you as the writer of it. And, and as the reader, uh, even, reading it, even writing it, I had, I had moments like that. There was at the time they first, they first make love in, um, I won't say where in case so I give, give anyone away, but it took, you know, just that, that love scene took, I don't know, two or three days to write, two days to write, three, I don't remember, it was a few, a couple of days to write, but I remember like, you know, I'd write some dialogue, whatever, in the morning I'd get it out and then I'd, I'd have to go and like take my kid to school, or whatever, right, right. Like, like remove myself from that hotel room and him and whatever, I remember being like, do not move, I'm coming right back, I'm going to take the kid, I'll, I'll be right back, don't go anywhere, no one move, no one go anywhere. Right. <laughs> nothing don't touch each other i'll be right back <laughs> but like but like it's like there's it's it's so all consuming and you even put that in the book too right when um when isabel calls right in the middle of that scene and she has right. to say like stay yeah. right there it's almost <laughs> like 
right? That was like, yeah, it's exactly like, what is this kid? Where, where did I get these kids from? Why, why are they demanding things of me? I'm like yeah. having the time of my life. Yeah. And yet you have to pick up the phone at all times because, you know, kids. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well now, cause I read that this was in development and now I'm wondering if you're reluctant to develop this into film because of all of the emotional baggage um, of the characters. What's the latest on that? So it's in development. I don't have as much say in it as I would like to have. Um, so, you know, at some point I feel like you, you birth a book it's your book. It's always going to be your book. And Hollywood takes it and they make it what they want to make it. And so I have to kind of like, be like, go with God. They're not, they're not mine. In, in that formation, they're not my people anymore. They're not, it's something else entirely. So we'll see, you know, I mean, I think that's kind of like the plight of the author, unless you have so much control. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, um, but I feel well, like, my, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. You, you can just, you just hope you're pleasantly surprised. Well, of... It's funny because even on Twitter, somebody who was tweeting both of us yesterday about it, right? Put the Harry Styles gif or whatever. Right. And it's like everybody is going to interpret this book and have their own haze in their right. heads already, right? Yes. Like I have, I, that's sure. not how I pictured him at all because right. um, he's so tall. And you know, I don't know. I just had like a different you know, not like Benedict Cumberbatch, but kind of like a taller, right. like British man right. vibe. But anyway, whatever. Um, when you do it in your head, when you're reading it, it's one thing, but then when somebody else gives a form to it. You right, to, exactly. Right? And they're never going to cast someone who's going to make every single reader happy. So you just have to, <laughs> have to, you have to let it go. And the haze in your head from the book can exist in your head from the book. And the haze in the movie can be the haze in the movie. And there you go. The Haze in the TV show spin-off. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would be interested because it's such a great story and also to reconnect with the characters um, as opposed to just like having the book to read again and again. Do you know what I mean? But, um, um, but it's pretty awesome. <laughs> so you should feel really good about it. I'm sure you do, but um, so much. it's pretty amazing. So I know you're not writing another love story and I totally get where your head's at. Um, but do you still write for you? I can't imagine that after all that you would stop. No, I stopped writing for me, which is really, really hard. And I'm, I'm trying to, like you try to kid yourself. Like, this is just for me. Don't, don't think too much about it. Um, you can't. I feel like once you've published and your words are out there in the world, I mean, I don't know those, I don't know writers who do it I have not spoken to any writers personally who can do it successfully and just let out all the noise. And I'd love to hear their pointers. I'm sure there are some who can, but I, I, I have all these little people on my shoulder now. It used to be just like my parents, like, what are my parents going to say? Like, <laughs> like, and this is, I can share this with you. Um, I've written a lot of stuff for myself and there've been love stories before and there've been sex scenes prior, but I was like, there's, n I'm never ever going to publish any of that stuff because my parents know, I know anything about sex. They're going to like, <laughs> they're, they're going to disown me. <laughs> like, and it literally was when I was pushing out my first child <laughs> and my mom was in the room along with my sister and my husband. And I, as I was pushing, I thought, oh my God, she now knows I've had sex. <laughs> this means I can write <laughs> like, and I can try to publish. <laughs> it was really that moment of pushing out my son, Alexander, that it was like this, like, I can write and publish books now because obviously. <laughs> yeah, cat's out of the bag. <laughs> he's crowning. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah, and so it used to be like, what are they going to say? And, and that was kind of it. And now it's what's my agent going to think? What's my publisher? What's an editor? What are any publishers going to think? And what are publicity people going to think? And bloggers and these readers and readers who love this, but wanted this and readers who love this part, but didn't want that. Like, I, I, it's not just me. And I really wish I could get back to the space where I could just not hear all that stuff and just hear my own voice. It's hard. Well, here's an assignment I'll give you. If you want to accept it, which you don't yes. have to. I have this new medium publication called Moms Don't Have Time to Write. And I think you should write about the, what you were talking about with saying goodbye to your characters and the trauma of letting go. 
of, of fictitious. Writing this down. I'm taking notes. Yeah, I think you should do it. The trauma of letting go of a fictitious love. Right. I mean, that is powerful and it's unique and it's awesome. And I would totally read an essay and it talks about you as a writer. And I think you should tap into that feeling of sadness and loss because it's really what it is. You had to lose somebody you were so close to and yet it was fiction. That's amazing. I don't know. I think you should write about that. Just write like a thousand words. Okay. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah. And nobody is going to really read it. I mean, it's a small publication. So, you know, you can like test your wings, but I think it would be good for you to write and send it to me and we'll see. What do you think? I think, yeah. think about I mean, it. Put it in the back of your head. I'm already thinking about it. Okay. Put it in the back. <laughs> um, well, what advice would you have for aspiring authors? Um, don't listen to anything I just said. <laughs> write yeah. for yourself. No, seriously. I think the reason... I don't think when I was writing, I wasn't sure who would connect with this, but I knew that I connected with it. And it was so important to me to get this out. And I loved it so much. Like every word I wrote, I loved it so much. And I really feel like it's important that you write what you want to write and you fall in love with what you're writing. And you think only about your own happiness when you're writing. Because I think if you're writing for an audience or you're writing thinking like, oh, well, a market or who will buy this or how it will be like I didn't even have a, a genre and people tell me all that like I remember I first workshopped it in my writers group when it was I workshopped it at like different stages like one month one chapter two chapters four chapters and then when it was finally complete and after four chapters I had a girlfriend said this is great but you know in romance novels there's like two or three love scenes that are soup to nuts and the other things are kind of vague and you start here and then you stop and did it and I was like what are you talking about? I was like, this isn't a romance novel. She's like, oh, it's not? And I was like, no, I like, I don't, I, at that point I didn't really read romance novels. I've read a bunch since because I have a lot of friends now who are authors who write romance novels. But it's like, I don't read romance no novels. I don't know what the formula is. And she was like, well, what is, what kind of book is it? And I was like, it's a woman's story. She's like, so it's kind of women's fiction. I was like, I guess. And she's like, well, her life has got to be messier. <laughs> I was like, what? And she's like, she's got to be like more things just like crazy. And I thought that was so, like, it's, I wasn't even thinking about a formula for any, any genre specifically. I was just writing one woman's story. Like she's got this life it, on, the, on the outside. It looks great. And for the most part, she's in control. And this guy comes into her life and turns everything upside down and in a good way and then not a good way. And she survives. It's great. Well, um, thank you for this book, which obviously transported you and also transported me, not just emotionally, but to all the amazing places in the book, as I said. And really, it's exactly what I needed to read after a year of quarantine and no travel. And <laughs> even LA, I used to be in LA all the time. And now we haven't been in over a year. And back at Barbarac and Saint-Tropez and like all these places and it just was amazing. Um, so, um, you know, a life that uh, none of us are leading right now. So um, I don't know this, I know it didn't just come out, but it's a good, it's a really good book for now. So, <laughs> and for whenever, but. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. Um, well, thank you so much, Robin. And I hope that you write even just a little, even a couple hundred. No, I am. I'm writing. I'm working on something now. It's just taking much longer than I ever thought it would take. But, you know, sometimes that happens. Take your time. Yeah. Take my time. All right. Time. Well, thank you. I'm so glad thank to have connected you. with you. Thank you so much. All take right. Care. Take Thanks. care. Bye-bye.